Adventure 11. The Final Problem It is with a heavy heart that I take up my pen to write these last words in which I shall ever record the singular gifts by which my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes was distinguished. In an incoherent, and as I deeply feel, an entirely inadequate fashion, I have endeavoured to give some account of my strange experiences in his company from the chance which first brought us together at the period of the study in Scarlet, up to the time of his interference in the matter of the naval treaty, an interference which had the unquestionable effect of preventing a serious international complication. It was my intention to have stopped there, and to have said nothing of the event which has created a void in my life which the lapse of two years has done little to fill. My hand has been forced, however, by the recent letters in which Colonel James Moriarty defends the memory of his brother, and I have no choice but to lay the facts before the public exactly as they occurred. I alone know the absolute truth of the matter, and I am satisfied that the time has come when no good purpose is to be served by its suppression. As far as I know, there have been only three accounts in the public press, that in the Journal de Genève on May 6th, 1891, the Reuters' dispatch in the English papers on May 7th, and finally the recent letter to which I have alluded. Of these, the first and second were extremely condensed, while the last is, as I shall now show, an absolute perversion of the facts. It lies with me to tell for the first time what really took place between Professor Moriarty and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. It may be remembered that after my marriage and my subsequent start in private practice, the very intimate relations which had existed between Holmes and myself became to some extent modified. He still came to me from time to time when he desired a companion in his investigation. But these occasions grew more and more seldom, until I find that in the year 1890 there were only three cases of which I retain any record. During the winter of that year, and the early spring of 1891, I saw in the papers that he had been engaged by the French government upon a matter of supreme importance, and I received two notes from Holmes, dated from Narbonne and from Nîmes, from which I gathered that his stay in France was likely to be a long one. It was with some surprise, therefore, that I saw him walk into my consulting room upon the evening of April 24th. It struck me that he was looking even paler and thinner than usual. "'Yes, I've been using up myself rather too freely,' he remarked in answer to my look rather than to my words. "'I've been a little pressed of late. Have you any objection to my closing your shutters?' The only light in the room came from the lamp upon the table at which I had been reading. Holmes edged his way around the wall, and flinging the shutters together, he bolted them securely. "'You are afraid of something?' I asked. "'Well, I am. Of what?' "'Of air-guns.' "'My dear Holmes, what do you mean?' I think that you know me well enough, Watson, to understand that I am by no means a nervous man. At the same time, it is stupidity rather than courage to refuse to recognize danger when it is close upon you. Might I trouble you for a match? He drew in the smoke of his cigarette, as if the soothing influence was grateful to him. I must apologize for calling so late, said he, and I must further beg you to be so unconventional as to allow me to leave your house presently by scrambling over your back garden wall. "'But what does it all mean?' I asked. He held out his hand, and I saw in the light of the lamp that two of his knuckles were burst and bleeding. "'It is not an airy nothing, you see,' said he, smiling. "'On the contrary, it is solid enough for a man to break his hand over. Is Mrs. Watson in?' "'She is away upon a visit.' "'Indeed, you're alone?' "'Quite.' "'Then it makes it the easier for me to propose that you should come away with me for a week to the continent. "'Where?' "'Oh, anywhere. It's all the same to me.' "'There was something very strange in all this. "'It was not Holmes' nature to take an aimless holiday, "'and something about his pale, worn face told me that his nerves were at their highest tension. "'He saw the question in my eyes, and putting his fingertips together and his elbows upon his knees, "'he explained the situation.' "'You have probably never heard of Professor Moriarty,' said he. "'Never.' "'Ay, there's the genius and the wonder of the thing,' he cried. "'The man pervades London, and no one has heard of him. "'That's what puts him on a pinnacle in the records of crime. "'I tell you, Watson, in all seriousness, "'that if I could beat that man, if I could free society of him, "'I should feel that my own career had reached its summit, "'and I should be prepared to turn to some more placid line in life. 
Between ourselves, the recent cases in which I have been of assistance to the royal family of Scandinavia and to the French Republic have left me in such a position that I could continue to live in the quiet fashion which is most congenial to me, and to concentrate my attention upon my chemical researches. But I could not rest, Watson, I could not sit quiet in my chair, if I thought that such a man as Professor Moriarty were walking the streets of London unchallenged. What has he done, then? His career has been an extraordinary one. He is a man of good birth and excellent education, endowed by nature with a phenomenal mathematical faculty. At the age of twenty-one he wrote a treatise upon the binomial theorem, which has had a European vogue. On the strength of it he won the mathematical chair at one of our smaller universities, and had, to all appearances, a most brilliant career before him. But the man had hereditary tendencies of the most diabolical kind. A criminal strain ran in his blood, which, instead of being modified, was increased and rendered infinitely more dangerous by his extraordinary mental powers. Dark rumors gathered round him in the university town, and eventually he was compelled to resign his chair, and to come down to London, where he set up as an army coach. So much is known to the world, but what I am telling you now is what I have myself discovered. As you are aware, Watson, there is no one who knows the higher criminal world of London so well as I do. For years past I have continually been conscious of some power behind the malefactor, some deep organizing power which forever stands in the way of the law, and throws its shield over the wrongdoer. Again and again, in cases of the most varying sorts, forgery cases, robberies, murders, I have felt the presence of this force, and I have deduced its action in many of those undiscovered crimes in which I have not been personally consulted. For years I have endeavored to break through the veil which shrouded it, and at last the time came when I seized my thread and followed it, until it led me, after a thousand cunning windings, to ex-professor Moriarty of mathematical celebrity. He is the Napoleon of crime, Watson. He is the organizer of half that is evil and of nearly all that is undetected in this great city. He is a genius, a philosopher, an abstract thinker. He has a brain of the first order, but sits motionless like a spider in the center of its web, but that web has a thousand radiations, and he knows well every quiver of each of them. He does little himself, he only plans. But his agents are numerous and splendidly organized. Is there a crime to be done, a paper to be abstracted, we will say a house to be rifled, a man to be removed? The word is passed to the professor, the matter is organized and carried out. The agent may be caught, in that case money is found for his bail or his defense, but the central power which uses the agent is never caught, never so much as suspected. This was the organization which I deduced, Watson, and which I devoted my whole energy to exposing and breaking up. But the professor was fenced round with safeguards so cunningly devised that, do what I would, it seemed impossible to get evidence which would convict in a court of law. You know my powers, my dear Watson, and yet at the end of three months I was forced to confess that I had at last met an antagonist who was my intellectual equal. My horror at his crimes was lost in my admiration at his skill. But at last he made a trip, only a little, little trip, but it was more than he could afford when I was so close upon him. I had my chance, and starting from that point, I have woven my net round him, until now it is all ready to close. In three days, that is to say on Monday next, matters will be ripe, and the professor, with all the principal members of his gang, will be in the hands of the police." Then will come the greatest criminal trial of the century, the clearing up of over forty mysteries, and the rope for all of them. But if we move at all prematurely, you understand, they may slip out of our hands, even at the last moment. Now, if I could have done this without the knowledge of Professor Moriarty, all would have been well, but he was too wily for that. He saw every step which I took to draw my toils round him. Again and again he strove to break away, but I as often headed him off. I tell you, my friend, that if a detailed account of that silent contest could be written, it would take its place as the most brilliant bit of thrust and parry work in the history of detection. Never have I risen to such a height, and never have I been so hard-pressed by an opponent. He cut deep, and yet I just undercut him. This morning the last steps were taken, and three days only were wanted to complete this business. I was sitting in my room thinking the matter over, when the door opened, and Professor Moriarty stood before me. My nerves are fairly proof, Watson, but I must confess to a start when I saw the very man who had been so much in my thoughts standing there on my threshold. His appearance was quite familiar to me. He is extremely tall and thin, 
his forehead domes out in a white curve, and his two eyes are deeply sunken in his head. He is clean-shaven, pale, and ascetic-looking, retaining something of the professor in his features. His shoulders are rounded from much study, and his face protrudes forward, and is forever slowly oscillating from side to side, in a curiously reptilian fashion. He peered at me with great curiosity in his puckered eyes, 